Innovation and Education, and I have the honor this evening to introduce our presenter, probably already known to most or all of you, Dr. Byron Wall. Uh, Byron joined our college and campus community 14 years ago, and during his time here, he has shown himself to be a gifted teacher, an acclaimed photographer, and really a delightful colleague. This evening is bittersweet for us because, as many of you know, uh, this will be his last official presentation as a member of the faculty of CSU Chico. Uh, he has taken a job at Temple University where he is going to go do great things. Hopefully. Absolutely. Uh, and, so, um, and so there's some poignance for us about this, this evening, but I, I know everybody is going to enjoy it. We feel very, very grateful that we have this opportunity to hear a little bit more about Byron's work before he too is perhaps not totally vanished. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll let him explain more about that. because it really drives ideas forwards and forces you to really grapple with uh, things that are often intangible. Uh, he's not here, but I want to thank President Zing. I talked to him about this idea and this project many years ago when it was just this wacky, goofy thing, and he was very supportive of the idea, and so I was, I'm quite grateful for that. There are some people in the audience that I want to thank tonight for a variety of reasons. Uh, these are folks who helped out in... Uh, numerous ways, often providing many of the resources you're going to see tonight. Uh, photographs, postcards, uh, help in a variety of ways. Uh, Dave Noble is at the top of the list, and he's here. Uh, Dave figures prominently into uh, much of this work, and I'll point him out as I go through it. Uh, Wes Dempsey, I don't know if he's here, but um, he's a, certainly an institution here at the university. He provides a lot of stuff. Uh, Randy Taylor, Ray Barnett, Jay Baggiato, Deb Baynard, and George Thompson were also quite helpful in ways that I can't even describe here. And then uh, two of my friends are here, P. Willie and Greg Callio, uh, have been uh, intrepid buddies as we've explored uh, many places in the North State, and I'm going to uh, point them out uh, on occasion. And uh, of course, my family, who is here right in the middle of the, uh, the room, they got the best seats in the house. Uh, they have uh, tolerated and indulged my peculiar, peculiar obsessions over the years. Um, and even my boys have been great sports as I've looked at them all around, looking for things like acorns and trees and, um, and who knows what else. So um, thank you all. Uh, so tonight I'm going to be talking about a collaborative project that's been going on uh, really for almost uh, uh, six or seven years, but in the last couple of years it's really gained momentum. Uh, these are the basic ideas that I'm going to be talking about tonight. So, uh, <laughs> if you didn't want to get lost, just refer back to this. It be okay. Um, no, really, that is a sort of diagram that I create when I'm putting together talks. It helps me think things through. This project is called uh, Vanish, the Chronicle of Loss and Discovery Across Half a Million Years. And it's very much a collaborative project. Um, I initially conceived of uh, the idea behind it, but about two years ago, through a series of circumstances that I'll recount here, um, I somehow uh, was able to convince a handful of other people to work with me uh, for nothing other than the pleasure of talking about things and exploring things. Uh, I really didn't have much more to offer than uh, the thought that it might be kind of interesting. So um, Heather Altfeld, Hannah Bearden, Oliver Hutton, uh, Troy Jollimore, Mike Maglieri, Sherry Simons, and Rachel Heatsdale are all part of this. And even though they're not standing up here right now, uh, they have played a major role in most of what I'm going to show you tonight. This is a project that is very much in progress. We've been working on it for about two years together. And I would estimate that we've got, okay, collaborators, brace yourself, two or three more years of work to do <laughs> before uh, we really get it to a point that it is um, uh, ready for the goals of exhibition and publication. That's ultimately what we're, what we're aiming for. Um, so what is collab what is uh, Vanished? Well, we had this explicit goal of working together as experts 
uh, to explore a shared geography, the North State in the region. And we were interested in discovering the intersection across disciplines and to derive meaning from the conversations that we had. The way that we've worked together has been pretty straightforward. Over the course of about a year, we would just gather periodically and we would share the discoveries that we had, we had made about different places and different sites and different things that we were uh, investigating. There were always a lot of conversations. Uh, I had the pleasure of being on sabbatical last fall to work on this project. And so I was often going out and making pictures that really responded to many of the conversations. What you're seeing tonight is very much a work in progress, and you are the first large audience that has seen most of what I'm gonna be talking about. So um, if I have any, any mistakes are mine, and I would ask that you uh, just gently correct me for any facts that I get wrong, and I am gonna have to move quickly, so I won't go into great depth on any specific thing. For me, this project really started to take shape about 20 years ago. I was in graduate school, and I don't recall why, but I happened to uh, read this book of poetry by Robert Haas called Praise, and there, was a sing there were two lines at the start of a poem that read, all the new thinking is about loss. In this, it resembles all the old thinking. And I don't know why, but that stuck in my brain, and I couldn't shake it. I think it was partly because, as one who deals with photographs, I'm constantly dealing with the past. By its very de definition, a picture is something that took place in the past. And I do a lot of work with historic photography, but I do, I make my own pictures, I, I do contemporary work. Um, but for some reason, that quote stuck in my head. Uh, then sometime in, I think it must have been about 2005, I, uh, I didn't necessarily uncover this picture, but I, I studied this picture a little bit more closely. And this is a photograph by a guy named Carlton Watkins. He's a, a well-known 19th century landscape photographer. He became best known for his pictures in Yosemite. Uh, and this is a photograph of Lassen, Lassen <coughs> Peak, which you can just sort of barely faintly make out there up at the top of that ripped piece of paper. This is the print that um, I've lugged around with me uh, for the last seven years as I've gone out and done this field work. I was interested in this picture because I work with historic photographs all the time, but in most cases I travel elsewhere to do my photography. And I was really interested in trying to learn a little bit more about the place in which I lived. And so I knew that this was a picture made in Lassen Park. And my dad, who happens to be here tonight, went with me on the first trip to try to find this. I thought it was going to be a nice, simple tour up to Lassen, drive around, pull off in some parking lot, and make a photograph from the same vantage point as this. Uh, that was very far from what happened, but I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, that picture was made as part of the U.S. Geological Surveys. On the left is a guy named Clarence King. He was in charge of that particular survey, the survey of the 40th parallel. He was a young geologist and an ambitious geologist, and uh, he was accompanied by Carlton Watkins on the right. That's a photograph of Watkins when he was older. And um, uh, Watkins was not a, a U.S. or U.S. Geological Survey photographer. He just happened to be hired for the last leg of this trip for reasons that I don't need to get into now. But Clarence King was interested in visiting Laxton and Shasta, and Shasta in particular, because he thought that there were active glaciers on Mount Shasta, and he wanted to be the first to prove that there were active glaciers in North America. And so it was an important thing for him to go there and to make photographs of it. Uh, that picture that I showed you was one that my dad and I didn't find. We drove around a little bit, it was a beautiful day, we enjoyed ourselves, but uh, Lassen Peak looked nothing like the photograph that I had, not even close. And so I came back, and Google Earth was uh, a sort of new thing, and I looked at Google Earth, and uh, I used it to match the snow patterns on Lassen Peak. And unfortunately, I moved some slides around, but um, there are these patches here, a patch there and a patch there, and um, I was able to match those to the satellite view of Google Earth. And eventually figured out that those pictures were made in this place called Chaos Crags, which is this 
big jumble of uplifted rock on the north side of Lassen. It looks kind of like this. <clears throat> if that's not daunting, then maybe that looks daunting. <laughs> that goes on and on and on and on and on. And um, <clears throat> that's P. Willie there. That's a picture from our, I think it's our first trip into the Chaos Crags. Uh, again, I thought this was going to be not an easy sort of thing, but a relatively simple hike to a place and make a picture of return. Well, it wasn't. I mean, we hiked, I don't know, three or four hours starting at the crack of dawn. Uh, by the time we got to the actual spot, the cloud <laughs> and uh, covered up Lassen Peak, and it was cold, and I was, I was absolutely exhausted. And uh, the picture that needed to be made was up on this rock. And I didn't even think I could climb it. I mean, I was, I was so tired. So we pulled the plug on that, and we came back, and that was our first trip. This is uh, P and uh, Greg, and we're starting our second climb into the Chaos Crags. And uh, it was a beautiful day that day. And uh, this is roughly where we needed to be. And uh, to give you some sense of the scale, that's P's hat right there. And that's Greg Kelly over there. And so these are absolutely enormous uh, stones that have been uplifted and shattered. Uh, it turns out that they're actually quite young. They're, it's, a, it's an area that's about 1,400 years old. That's 1,400 years old, which is remarkably young geologically. And um, as Rachel, our resident geologist, describes it, she says it was, it's sort of formed like um, peanut butter that kind of gets uplifted and separates. And, you know, I climbed on it, and it's not at all like peanut butter. <laughs> uh, it's sharp, and it's jagged, and, and it doesn't smell like peanut butter or anything like that. But anyway, um, we visited the spot, and, and I made this picture. So that's the 19th century view embedded into the contemporary space. That's P right there, and Greg is tucked away. Right, right over there. Okay. So that was that. Um, that's the full image right there. Um, and I, are, you, are you the one that started clapping? You're <laughs> <laughs> like chumming the waters. <laughs> so, okay. Um, I, I got to keep moving here because this is just the smallest part of it. Um, so, I did this and I thought, okay, that's great, I'm done. Um, I knew that there were other pictures of Lassen and Shasta, but. Uh, I'd get to them eventually, and that was quite an adventure. Uh, this is a view kind of coming down out of, uh, out of the Chaos Crags. And uh, so I got back, and I don't remember exactly when, but at some point I was sitting in my office here on campus. My office is the Hema 267. So if you need to come see me during my office hours, that's where I am. <laughs> Tehama 267. And I was sitting there one day and just thinking, Tehama, that's a weird word. What does Tehama mean? And so I looked it up. And I learned all kinds of things. Uh, not the least of which is that Tehama was the name for a volcano that was on the flanks of Mount Lassen. And so from the spot where P and Greg and I went to to make this picture, if you were to superimpose a volcano, that's a volcano I made in, uh, what's the Google uh, something? What's that? SketchUp. I made that in SketchUp and dropped it in there. Um, if you were at that vantage point, Mount Tehama would look something like that. It's purely speculative because maybe it wasn't a perfect volcano shape, maybe it was more of a dome, but um, anyway, it would have looked something like that. So we had to go back. <laughs> No, no, well, not just because of that, but because I also at the same time learned that there were other photographs made in the same spot. And so this is the second version from our third or fourth trip. I lose track. To give you some sense of scale here, that's an airplane that's floating above Tehama and Lassen. And one thing that Watkins did, which is unusual for him, is... He made a photograph. Oh, I got to show you this. So uh, this is kind of moving the camera around, almost looking north. 
that's Mount Shasta there. Anyway, he made a photograph at almost 180 degrees looking in the opposite direction. And he just set up his camera and he made two pictures and rotated his camera. I don't know why he did that exactly, but it turns out he did it several times in, in Lassen and in Shasta. It's not something I've ever seen him do in any other place and I've tracked down many of his photographs in the past. Um, so uh, this image is intended for exhibition and here's a bit of irony for you. Uh, its final print size is probably about twice the size of what you're seeing there on the screen. It's a very large image that's uh, 40, about 44 inches high. It's made from individual pictures that then get stitched together using software. And so it's an incredibly sharp, incredibly detailed picture where you can uh, where the airplane uh, or anything like that. That's where the camera was positioned. Now, I don't know why he chose to set up where he set up, but he did. I think you saw that picture already. That picture uh, is approximately right here, coming out of the Chaos Crags. And this was a photograph that was unlabeled, the original 19th century one. And it just said a view from the Cascades or something like that. I never thought I would find it, but I happened to have that snapshot of Greg leaving the Chaos Crags. There's this other enormous block. This is all, uh, yeah, there's another block. Hey, there's my hat. Um, I throw that in there a lot for scale, just to get a sense of the space, you know, so you kind of get a sense of where it is. That's P up there, uh, gazing. Uh, these all have titles, and I'm not going to read all of them to you. <clears throat> this is a view kind of coming back from last and just looking back at it. Just real quickly, I'm going to go through some more stuff. This is in, uh, this is just off the flanks of Lassen, and this is looking at a place called Bumpus Hill, for those of you that have visited it. That's the Carlton Watkins picture, and you can see a couple of figures right there. And one of those is probably Clarence King, but I can't, I have no way of verifying that, but um, he, he shows up in a few pictures here and there. Uh, <clears throat> there's my hat again. And, uh, Watkins did just the exact same thing here where he panned around and made a view from the, the exact same vantage point. This poses a, a bit of a challenge for me because I not only have to be accurate looking one way, I have to be accurate looking another way. So it makes for uh, slow work. Fortunately, it's not that hard to get back up there. But this particular site, uh, I think we went to over the years about five times. The Chaos Crags site we went to about five times because of discovering new pictures or having clouds or all sorts of issues. So that's the full view. Uh, this is looking back towards Lassen. And so that quote that I had in my head about all the new thinking is about loss. In this, it resembles all the old thinking. And the discovery that Tehama was this stratovolcano that was formed about 600,000 years ago and disappeared over time uh, really got me to thinking about how do you make photographs of things that have vanished? How can you describe something that's no longer with us? And I became really interested in that idea. This site was a real challenge because I, uh, because I realized that where this photograph was made was actually inside the volcano itself. So we're kind of tilting out and pulling back. And then suddenly we're outside the volcano. And when I got to this point, and I had been fiddling with this picture and this idea for a few years, I realized I was in trouble. Because I really didn't have the tools or the skills or the expertise to describe many of the questions that I was asking myself about this spot in this picture. Like, what would it be like to describe what it's like inside a volcano? If you could stand where Watkins stood and look one direction and see one thing and see something else, how would you describe what you saw if you were in the heart of a volcano? And I realized then that I needed to be working with other people. And it was really about that point that I decided I need experts in fields to help deal with things that are invisible to me, but that would be interesting to most people. 
So um, here's a picture I made not too long ago. This is Lassen in eruption. I don't know exactly when this was. It was probably uh, 1914. Um, it, it erupted for, for various time periods. This is up kind of near Chaos Crags uh, by a place called Reflection Lake. And that's my re photograph. And uh, I call that Ghost Plume on Reflection Lake. This is a photograph, the first uh, photograph ever made of an active glacier in North America, in California. This is uh, on, on Shasta, it's between Shasta and Shastina, just north of here. And uh, this fall, Greg Calio and I went up there to try to make uh, re photographs of this spot. Now, that distortion that you see right there um, is because I stretched the Watkins picture to try to match my own photograph. Whenever I don't get my camera in the exact same vantage point as the 19th century or previous photographers, things don't quite line up and I have to stretch and distort to try to create the illusion that I was in the right spot. This was my first attempt to try to use an iPad to make a photograph and work with it and try to make sure that I was in the right spot. It didn't work very well. Um, not only was not only did that not work very well, but I was really tired and it was a uh, it was a hard climb for me carrying all, all that stuff. Um, Greg, however, left about like it didn't bother him at all. So if we go back, he's going to carry everything. <laughs> anyway, so that's a that's a picture of an active glacier. Now uh, I could spend a long time talking about glaciers. It turns out that several of the glaciers on Mount Shasta are uh, a few in, a few in the entire world that are actually staying the same size. We're getting to be a little bit larger. Most of the glaciers in the world are getting to be smaller. This is according to a report that came out in 2006. Uh, that report cites local weather variability, or an increase in precipitation as being the predominant reason for the growth, uh, whereas temperature changes are seem to be having less of an effect on those glaciers right there. These are some of the kinds of questions that we're asking you know, why are glaciers getting bigger or smaller in, in our collaboration? And these are things that having someone like Rachel uh, on board are very useful for. This is believed to be a picture of Clarence King uh, probing the depths of the crevasse on the Whitney Glacier right there. And that's my re-photograph that sort of puts him in context and to pan around and sort of looks up uh, up the valley to the north. Uh, one of the things that I learned from going to, in particular, this glacier, but also up into Lassen as well, is how incredibly dynamic the landscape is. When I was making this photograph, for example, the glacier was melting. It was September, late August, September, I can't remember now. The glacier was melting. Water was rushing in front of me. It was almost, it wasn't quite deafening, but it was quite loud, the, just the sound of the water rushing underneath the glacier. All along the banks right here, large boulders were frequently tumbling off and big plumes of dust were coming up. I don't have it in this one, but in another view, I have a sort of plume of dust coming up. And it really struck me how alive these kinds of places are and how dynamic they are. Even things like the Chaos Crash, which is only 1,400 years old, it's just, it's, it was just sort of remarkable and it changed my sense of what some of these landscapes are like. I don't even want to talk about that, but it's a really beautiful illustration that I didn't make. <laughs> of glaciers on uh, Mount Shasta. Uh, so just one more thing about Shasta. This is an aerial view of Shasta. And I, I, I love its detail, but I also love how you can see all of these sort of lava flows here. And uh, I'm going to kind of pan over here. You can see all these little things right here. They're, they're called hillocks, and I'll show, you, show them to you in another view. Uh, when, when Clarence King visited Shasta, this was in 1871, I think, uh, he wrote about uh, all of those little hillocks. These are three Carlton Watkins pictures that almost, they were almost all made from the same spot, but not quite. These are not very well-known photographs. 
they're pretty poor quality. They, it's been very difficult to work with. Um, but Greg and Dee, my boys, uh, went with me and we, we tracked these down and, and uh, found the spot for them. So that's, that was Shasta in November, several years ago, 2007 maybe. You can sort of see some details. All those little, little, little specks there, those are cows. Um, so this is the quote from Clarence King, uh, who wrote about his experience in a, in a book that he published. Uh, Shasta as a whole is the single cone of an immense extinct volcano about its base cluster hillocks of, hundred, of a hundred little volcanoes, but they are utterly inconspicuous under the shadow of the great peak. And he's talking about all these little forms right here. It wasn't until the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980, a full hundred years later, that it was understood what those miniature hillocks and volcanoes actually were. And this is a video of the eruption of Mount St. Helens. just this really remarkable thing where the eruption is sort of taking place laterally and stuff's being shoved out. And so there are these enormous blocks and you see a, a plume kind of go up there too. But those enormous blocks were pushed out and then eventually covered with sediment. And that's what those little miniature hillock volcanoes were. There are the facts of that, which I think are kind of interesting. But what I find to be even more fascinating about that is how science functions as a metaphor. We had to see something somewhere else before we could apply it to this idea of what these little hills were. And I love that idea. And it's actually not too dissimilar from how artists often work, where we're, we're, we're playing with things metaphorically. This is the last picture we, well, that's after we came down. So those are my boys, that's Pete and Gray. Guys, you made it into the, <laughs> And then Rachel sent this quote, Geo, uh, from Charles Darwin, no less, who I would rarely take issue with, but he says, geologizing in volcanic country is most delightful. Besides the interest attached to itself, it leads you into the most beautiful and retired spots. And I got that from Rachel, and I thought, yeah, that's right. It's just beautiful to be up there. And as I was putting back this, putting this lecture together, I realized how physically arduous it was to do that work. I, it's like LP all the time. People in the 19th century were a lot tougher than we are. <laughs> anyway, okay, so um, uh, after most of that, I, I'm kind of getting out of sequence here, but uh, at some point along there, I decided it was time to bring in collaborators. Um, and I also identified other places and icons in the area that I thought were, were worthy of investigation and that had somehow disappeared. And so now I'm going to talk about several of those. This is uh, a photograph of Ishii, and I'm going to assume, based on uh, the demographics of people here, that most of you all know who Ishii is. But very briefly, he was uh, a Native American who lived his entire life north of Chico between uh, Deer Creek and Mill Creek, um, up and down from uh, Lassen all the way into the valley. And in 1911, he emerged from the wilderness, as the saying goes, that's the, the, the regular phrase, and uh, he appeared at a slaughterhouse in Oroville. He was believed to be the last of his group. Uh, he was the only one who, who was known to speak his native language, and so he emerged in a completely different world. These are pictures of him in 1911. Um, within days of him showing up in Warville. These are some photographs, and I, I'm showing you these because you may never have seen these. These are uh, some photographs of Ishii in 1913, so about two years after he uh, appeared in Warville. If you know his story at all, it's because you might have read this book. Uh, this book is called Ishii in Two Worlds, and it's by Theodora Kroger. Now, Ishii, like all of these, is a story that I could spend hours talking about if I were that well versed in this story. Um, but this is a book that came out in 1961. So uh, what is that? 50 years after he appeared in Oroville. And it's a story that uh, recounted Ishii's life and his experience of 
moving from one world into the next. And it's also a story that popularized what happened to Ishii. Uh, <clears throat> that copy that I'm showing you was my wife's. It's my wife's that came from her grandparents that no doubt bought it. It was a second or third edition. And it's filled with these photographs of Ishii where he's uh, demonstrating hunting and swimming um, and any number of things. I didn't think it was going to be possible to do anything with these photographs or Ishii's story at all. In fact, I was uh, reluctant to even do anything with it. Why did I even start? Pete, was this your idea? <laughs> I don't know why this happened, but um, uh, I, I know I was interested in the photographs as documents because I thought that they had never really been investigated as documents. You know, uh, someone might research Ishii's story, someone might research uh, any number of uh, documents or artifacts, but the photographs themselves interested me, and I thought that they deserved a little bit of an exploration. So, um, uh, Mike and P and I went out to a marker, which is up in Oroville, that marks the site where Ishii emerged from the wilderness. And uh, the quote on the, the marker right there says, it marks an end to Stone Age California. And I think that's uh, quite poignant, actually, to, to use a phrase like that, that we can identify a specific spot to when, to when and where a, an era ended. Uh, that, that just, that does something. Uh, so anyway, this is a monument at the site of the former slaughterhouse in Corral. This gentleman right here was photographed in 1966, and his name is Adolf of Ad Kessler. And he is at the, at the site of the slaughterhouse. He was a teenager, a young boy, and he is one of a couple of young gentlemen who, who, who found Ishii. And, he, and he's presumably pointing to a spot where he found Ishii crouching beneath a tree. Uh, there's a fence there, and that's a, that's a large post that's right there. Well, that post is still there. And this is the contemporary scene. Even that picket fence is still there, though most everything else has disappeared. Um, that image is not as sharp as I would like. Our projector is not quite dialed in up there. But anyway, um, that drives me crazy. I spent forever trying to make these as sharp as possible. <laughs> anyway, this is Adolf Ad Kessler, a young boy and slaughterhouse employee in 1911 pointing to the spot where Ishii emerged from the wilderness. So not only is there a monument, but there's a spot that we can point to that marks the end of the Stone Age. Uh, it took a while, but uh, eventually uh, uh, we planned a trip to get down to Deer Creek, where Ishii spent most of his life, and where uh, Ishii and the anthropologist with whom he was working and living uh, they, they went back to revisit the site in 1914 to, to map the place, to, uh, to get place names, to learn the stories that are associated with the place. And in fact, that's where the photographs that were made uh, of Ishii hunting and um, doing a variety of things. That's Dave's dog down there. So this was a trip that uh, Dave Noble certainly helped spearhead. That's Deer Creek late in the afternoon uh, this past September. There's Dave standing in the cool waters of Deer Creek. This is looking back. Late in the afternoon. Just after sunset. Uh, Heather Altfeld and Troy Jollimore were along for this part of the expedition. And this was our kitchen camp uh, set up on, the, on a beach there, a stone beach. And it looks calm and placid, but the waters of Deer Creek were actually quite loud. So you would think you could have a nice, quiet dinner there at the water's edge. Um, but we kind of had to shout to just be able to hear each other. And Dave spent an evening telling us wonderful stories. And I heard about every fourth word. Um, <laughs> they were still exciting. <coughs> anyway, so this is on the edge of Deer Creek. And uh, there's some of my photographs with a stone. My hat makes an appearance again. Um, but I'm, I'm sort of just showing you a few site pictures 
one of the things that I did, and we had a very brief time to do this, one of the things I did is I took all the photographs that I could find of each year from this history trip, I printed them out and I took them with us, and I spent some time walking around and figuring out where they were made, and I put them at the spot where they were made, and just put down some stones. There's Dave's dog, Mindy. Um, so every spot, every picture that you see right here is a spot where a photographer, probably a guy named Saxton Pope, uh, made pictures of Ishii. There's one really well-known picture of Ishii standing in front of a rock, and he's putting together a harpoon, and it's that rock right there. The beach that we're standing on has changed so much. It's about six feet higher than in 1911. There was no way for me to even get close to making a re-photograph, so this was the best that I could do. <laughs> this is uh, probably the, the biggest and kind of most ambitious uh, group of pictures from from that trip, and um, it starts here on the left, and that's Troy back in the back there. He was reading a book, and Heather was working on a poem, and uh, it kind of sweeps around here to a stone that's right in the center of the creek that Ishii was perched atop. And uh, this took me uh, the better part of uh, half a day, I think, to, to do this piece because it's relatively complex. And at some point, I don't know if Troy and Heather could hear me, but um, I, I kind of started laughing, not maniacally, but laughing, something like <laughs> that. Um, because I had all these pictures with me, and I didn't know how they were going to connect in space and in Deer Creek. And at first, I was only able to identify one or two. And in fact, that one right there, I thought, I'm never going to be able to figure out where that is. It just, he's in the middle of the water. How are you going to figure that out? And after being there and just sort of standing there and watching and watching and watching, uh, I eventually was able to figure out where that picture belonged by the flow of the water uh, in the creek. And so I laughed at the sort of poignancy of that to me. Just if you look at something long enough, you know, something as unstable as, as water can become an anchor for something. And uh, it's kind of a, a moment I, I won't forget easily. So these are all pictures of Ishii uh, kind of moving through space and he, he fashioned that spear and he was hunting salmon, mostly for the camera. And there are no photographs of him with the salmon, so I don't think he was successful. So this is the full piece, and it's titled uh, Perched Atop 15 Million Year Old Love, Love Joy Basalt, Ishii Demonstrating How to Hunt Salmon in Deer Creek. Summer 1914. Uh, so I've got a sequence of, of several pictures here of Ishii. Uh, uh, this is looking down Deer Creek, and uh, this is titled uh, Carefully Posed on Basalt Stage Number 2 with a View Down Deer Creek Canyon, Autumn 2012 and Summer 1914. Uh, there was also this other photograph that I was trying to locate that I thought was going to be impossible. Uh, it turns out it, was, uh, it wasn't easy, but it uh, wasn't as difficult as I thought. This is a big sort of mound. Um, and there's a lip underneath it, and it turns out if you sort of just drop down, it's filled with this sort of grass and, and brush here, and it was the site where numerous photographs were made of Ishii uh, building certain kinds of tools, and I don't even think I have the title for this one, but uh, he was, he was uh, hardening uh, a shaft here. Yeah, Ishii drying a fire drill. Deer Creek Canyon, beneath basalt stage number two. Uh, these are two, two photographs of Ishii that are uh, sort of part of the record, but they first appeared in 1918 in an academic journal. Um, and there were two different articles written about him. One of them was about uh, Yana Indians, and the other was about uh, how Ishii uh, built his tools and how he hunted. And so these were the first published photographs of Ishii. I was able to buy these on eBay 
um, which makes it convenient because then I can do whatever I want with them. Um, <coughs> This is the contemporary space, and there's an oak tree that's in, present in both scenes right there. Mm -hmm. Here's another one. Uh, it's just standing a little bit further back, and my title for this is 43 Years Before Theodora Kroeber's Ishi and Two Worlds Popularized His Story. The first published pictures demonstrating Yahi archery on a basalt stage. 1914 and 2012. Part of my reference to the Kroeber book is that you have to think there was a period of, of almost 50 years where Ishii's story wasn't, it wasn't unknown, but it wasn't the popular story that we know today. And it took somebody to create a story, to turn it into something that made his story something that everybody could access, and it became an emblem for something. It became emblems for a lot of different things, and it's so complicated, I, I can't really get into everything tonight, but I need to keep moving. This is after the archery demonstration, only 100 meters from their camp, autumn 2012 and summer 1914. Uh, this is where I slept. It was probably 50 meters from the shore of Deer Creek. And there were these uh, two pretty interesting rocks here. That's my pack. That's a, uh, a tree that I rested my head against. That's an old mattress spring that was right behind my head. And that's the tree that I hung my socks on to dry them after <laughs> spending time in Deer Creek. But it turns out that, um, you know, right where I would wake up in the morning and look, was the site of uh, Ishii. Um, <clears throat> this piece, I, I need to show you this next view right here. This is one of the first ones where I started experimenting with using, um, using, his, using text, historic text, along with my documents. And I know you can't read it, but right here is a quote lifted right out of one of those journals. And it came from Saxton Pope, who was Ishii's physician and friend. And the quote is, Ishii loved his bow as he loved nothing else in his possession. From his friend and physician, Saxon D. Um, I have to point out, my friend Dave hiding up there. <laughs> yeah, you barely see him up there. And Mindy is there too. Just sort of barely see him. Um, this is a blank page, and it shouldn't be, but it is. But I'll tell you what it is, and it's a reference to. Uh, the Pope and, Pope and Young Archery Club, which is a club that exists today, uh, and it's uh, oriented towards people who want to learn how to hunt using a bow and arrow. And it's named after Saxton T. Pope, who learned many of Ishii's ways and documented them through these photographs. So in many ways, Ishii's story continues through the, the Pope and Young Club. Just a couple more pictures of Ishii. Uh, these are some that were done on a completely separate trip. They're not on the banks of Deer Creek, but they're on a, in a storage cave. And uh, uh, this is an account of Ishii's uh, storage blanket, which he's, he kept in this cave right here, and he kept it out of the elements and kept, uh, kept it from getting wet. And uh, it was a site of confrontation. When, we, when they went back in 1914, there was a confrontation with the guide who was actually the one responsible for stealing uh, Ishii's, store, Ishii's coat. And so he spent a very cold winter there at one point. Um, that's Ishii uh, within the cave. That's titled Inside Ishii's Storage Cave, Hidden from Sight but Exposed to the Outside World. And I guess I'll point out again, that's Dave right there. I, and that's my hat for scale. That wooden structure that you see right there was still present. Uh, in fact, this is a, one of the big rails from it. And there's a little notch right there, which is, is it that notch? Yeah, I think it's that notch right there. Um, it was still there and still preserved. This is Ishii. Uh, this is purely speculation on my part, but uh, I think this, is, this was a photograph made moments after the confrontation he had with the person who stole his, uh, his uh, bearskin coat. 
and it's a slight sort of double exposure. He moved his head, but um, I've seen a lot of pictures of Ishii, and you know, in many of many of them, his expression is actually quite bright and lively. But in this one, he's very somber, and uh, I wouldn't say contemplative is the right word, but um, he's certainly reflective there. And uh, that's the that's his the drying rack that's still there. So this is uh, Ishi Storage Cave, a site of conflict and hardship, isolated and unchanged for a century. That's uh, the same same post there with the bark missing right there. I think one of the things that uh, working with the Ishi pictures has taught me is that history is measured in generations. I work with historic pictures a lot, and I, I experience this expansion and compression of space, of time, a fair amount. But with the issue pictures in particular, I was really astonished at how time compressed when I could find a place where Ishii lived and many of the things that he worked with and touched were still there and the place really seemed virtually unchanged. Um, in the case of Ishii, barely two generations have passed and very much has endured since Ishii sat in that cave, that cave presumably reflecting on his life. And, um, but that was just sort of another poignant experience for me. I showed you that big panorama in Deer Creek that had uh, Heather working on the side, and she was writing this poem. When Ishii emerged from the wilderness in Oroville, he was entered into the Oroville, uh, what do you call it, register, jail, what's it, register book? Um, and he, he was given the name Indian Comma Wild. And this is Heather's poem. On the last night of the long concealment, as he walked beneath the bright moon, four sleeps down from the mountain toward the prickle of lantern light in the valley. Did he still stop to dust away his footprints, to sprinkle dried leaves over his steps? Did he crawl on his belly through the runway of rabbits and weasels, rather than walk the wide of bears? Did he allow one small twig to surrender and break? in the pitchy blackness, listening to its split, dry sound. The creek he left behind in the darkness vowed to keep turning and tumbling in his absence. The boulders vowed to rest beneath the stars. The stars vowed to remain seated in their dark nests. The trees screened any shadow that might lean. The creek, I'm sorry, uh, lean into their trunks. The wisps of smoke from each tiny fire he had made against the rocks remained in the wind. Dragonflies rose in the blue afternoon when he arrived at the jail house, bent and worn, asking for nothing, or asking maybe for something. The pitch of one voice calling to another, that clattering of sound, a whole echo rising out from a throat, up into the uncertain particles of light. That's a perfect example of why I feel ever. I can't do that. So here's a different story. Uh, in the uh, fall of 1999, my first fall here, I uh, got this inside Chico State. Um, magazine that goes out, and uh, I read about how students performed a mammoth tooth extraction right here in Chico, in Upper Bidwell Park. And I thought, are you serious? That's amazing. And then it showed up in the Chico Enterprise record, and I, I remember reading it that day. And um, this recounts the story of Vic Fisher, who's here, and how he and his class discovered a mammoth's molar in Upper Bidwell Park right behind, uh, very near Wildwood Park, as part of the Sycamore Creek Diversion uh, Bypass. And uh, there were these four photographs that appeared in that article. And just like that quote that I read to you from 20 years ago, this just stuck in my head for a long time. And when I started thinking about things that had vanished, I thought about that mammoth molar. And I thought, how great would that be to do something about the vanished molar? <laughs> And um, uh, so we started looking and investigating, and I met with Vic and, and uh, 
Vic and I took a walk along the diversion dam, which, if, you know, if you've been in Uncle Bidwell Park, you recognize that from the park right there. This is, um, this is a sign that you would see to keep you from driving along the banks right there, but you can certainly walk, and people walk along there all the time. And this might look familiar to you. You might have been to this spot, but this is a sort of dry creek bed that's used for flood control. And when water reaches a certain level, then uh, water's automatically diverted and it passes through here. Well, this is a place that uh, Vic took his students on a very regular basis because it has a very complex geology. And you can walk, oh, I don't know, a half of a mile and see all kinds of things happening and all sorts of confusing things happening that the students have to try to figure out. And so at one point, in must have been 99 or 98, uh, he and his students found the mammoth, I'm sorry, the molar of a mammoth. So we went back to sort of try to find the spot. And this was almost 14 years after the fact, and, and it was a little difficult to find. It couldn't quite identify where it was. And we were looking at all these sorts of shells, and this is ultimately where uh, we sort of decided that it seemed to be the most plausible for it to be. And so that's uh, Vic staring at the spot where uh, quite possibly the the mammoth's molar was found. The story of the molar uh, is a little, uh, a little complex and maybe a little poignant. Uh, it, they excavated it, they brought it back to the university, and then students were working on, working on it in the lab to clean it up, and while they were doing that, it just disintegrated. It vanished. And so, we don't have it. But the story of the mammoth's molar still exists. And I was very interested in the story of it. So I started making pictures. And this is uh, part of the project that Sherry Simons has been uh, working on a lot as well. I didn't know what to do. How do you make, how do you tell the story of, of a mammoth's molder that's disappeared and you're not quite sure where it came from and you don't have it anymore? So I just started making photographs. Uh, and these are large pictures. And I thought, you know, it might be kind of interesting to walk up the creek, as the term Vic used is walk up section. Um, it'd be interesting to walk up section and just sort of see how the geology changes and sort of think about these as moving through time. So I started making those pictures and um, I'm okay with them, they're kind of interesting, but along the way I started seeing other things that I thought were sort of interesting. And that's looking back at the fields with the lights. There's my hat again. And uh, I started seeing all these marks and tracks that were left by all kinds of things, all kinds of animals. And so I spent one day just photographing every mark or track that I could find. And so on the far left, those are, uh, these are dog tracks, anything that was walking or climbing, I took a photograph of. And then uh, humans, anything walking, riding, biking, and then, you can't see it, but I've got a footprint right there, that's me. And uh, then we have some raccoon and bird and plant and wind marks and lizards and some unknown scratch in the surface there. And um, it was just sort of one of those occasions where I thought, you know, maybe we're, we ought to look for everything else besides the mammoth's mold. Maybe there are other things to be discovered here. Sherry and I went out on this walk uh, to collect artifacts. <laughs> And I'm not kidding, this is the first set of things that we found. Uh, these, of course, are the little dental floss things that you would, you know, that humans use. I, that's presumably how many a mammoth would need to floss. <laughs> so uh, we went out and started collecting artifacts together, and we would just periodically meet. We'd say, hey, you know, could you meet out here on the, uh, at the ditch? We call it the ditch. And uh, so we would go collect artifacts. So this is just a sequence of different artifacts that we discovered. Uh, socks, underwear, uh, you know, various cups and bottles. Uh, this one, I thought this was kind of poignant. Uh, that's in Shasta Cola. <laughs> Ziploc baggie full of some shell fragments that I found in the middle of the ditch in, in September. 
and they're just, they're really beautiful, and they're big, and they're thick, and they're speckled, and blue, and brown, and white, and yes, I tried to fit them all together to make a single egg, and I couldn't get any two pieces to fit us at all, and so, um, and I still don't know exactly what type of uh, eggshell they are, but, but, um, but we're working on that. <laughs> Uh, this was a card, the front and back, and it was somebody's note cards for studying. And, and they were trying to learn uh, metalloids and periodic tables and mixtures and uh, various definitions on the back. Uh, a bike lock. A fork from a bicycle, which if you squint, it maybe looks like mammoth tusks a little bit. <laughs> uh, this is an airplane wing, the front and back. Oh, this is where it starts to get really good, because we're getting really close to finding a mammoth's ball. Uh, here's some balls. That one says doozy on it. These are a variety of pellets from pellet guns. These are a variety of targets for pellet guns. Uh, an apple, a sort of plastic thing, and then this, uh, this is a, a paper or plastic plate, actually. So, these are all artifacts discovered while searching for a mammoth molar at the Sycamore Creek Diversion Channel. Um, so uh, here's something that Sherry's been doing. And uh, she's been, I, I scan the artifacts, and then she's taking all of these artifacts. And uh, you know, she's doing a number of different things. But one of the things she's doing is taking these, and this is a, an aluminum casting of the uh, plate and there's a, one of the pellet balls, and there's some other pellet balls kind of buried in there. And, uh, you know, artists work like this a lot. We don't always necessarily know quite what we're doing while we're doing it, but there's something pretty interesting here about uh, taking these artifacts and discoveries and turning them into something tangible and creating meaning out of something that seems to be meaningless. And uh, so that's one, that's a, a piece uh, Sherry showed me yesterday. Here are a few other pictures. That's Sherry searching for artifacts in the ditch. It is a large panorama uh, made last fall. And I didn't know it at the time, but we were going to have a really record high water this winter. And so this is November, a re-photograph from the exact same spot. And uh, this was a spectacle in the greatest sense of the word. Uh, here's a large panorama. There's just somebody biking along, and they had to go get their camera to come out and take a picture. That's my oldest son there. That's, yeah, it was a really remarkable event. That's my youngest son over there. That was a storm clearing away as the, the water just sort of scoured out the ditch. Um, you know, I have to say that while looking for the molar, it has forced us to look at this place very closely and very carefully over time. And it has completely changed our relationship to a diversion ditch. Uh, we love it. Sherry and I love it. The other collaborators love it. We go there. There's something very primal about it. And all it took was this thing that was discovered there to get us out there uh, and experience it. This is looking in another direction. And so those are two views kind of merged together. So I know you're dying to know what a Colombian mammoth's molar looks like. And you're, so here, well, here are some things that Sherry has done with her, done with her students. She wants to know what they think a molar looks like. So she's been doing these napkin sketches. And, uh, and so she, she gets these napkins and she asks them to draw what they think a, mo a molar from a mammoth looks like. And I love these because they give you sort of insights into what it is people expect when they're looking for something. That one's kind of cute-like, and it's six inches by four inches. That's Linda's. Oliver, that's your dad's right there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we all did this. Um, I don't know those balloons. <laughs> I think that's a little house up there. <laughs> We've got directions, look up. 
So anyway, these are wonderful. She's collecting mammoth stories as well. It turns out that a lot of people have mammoth stories and dreams. They have dreams about mammoths. I didn't know this, but she's collecting them. And it's really kind of fascinating to, to, um, to kind of gather that material. That one just very, uh, what is that? That's just a rugged looking one too. <laughs> He's <laughs> human. There's one in every class, isn't there? And I like this one. It's like it's almost like a police chalk album. <laughs> so very quickly, I've got a few more pictures uh, of the ditch itself. Um, it's right beside a residential area, and you, you know, you walk in, and somebody's got their newspaper, and, I, and uh, yeah. So uh, uh, these are just a variety of things discovered along in the ditch. So we go back there periodically. My oldest son loves it. We go there all the time. Who would have thought a ditch would have so much interesting stuff? I think of all the places that we're working, this one's been perhaps the most challenging because we haven't figured out, it took us so long to figure out how to respond to it and how to uh, deal with the absence of something. Uh, and, and it took us a while to kind of figure it out, but I think it's very much just about the act of looking and discovering, and then deriving meaning out of those discoveries. That's playing with ice. We don't get that in Chico very much. I love how it looks like a web that's stitching together <coughs> the rocks. weekend. I haven't been able to get out there as much as I'd like lately, but these are, these are very recent. Okay, you, you ready for a mammoth smolder? Yeah. That's a rock. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought it was an interesting looking rock. No, here it is. No, that's a rock too. <clears throat> well, I tell you, <laughs> you're going to have to go look for yourself. <laughs> No, really, for this place, it's it's uh, I, a lot of the conversations we've had about this are um, what sorts of questions should we be asking at these different sites, and um, and what do we find if we just we simply look? And so I think those are a lot of the things that we're we're playing with at, at this particular site. I have one last uh, site to show you. This project has about seven total. We've only worked on about three of them uh, in any great depth. This is the last one. Uh, this is a picture of the Joseph Hooker Oak. You see a figure perched beneath it. This is a photograph out of a book called Calfor California Romantic and Beautiful. And uh, uh, in it, it describes this magnificent tree that lived in Chico. Uh, the second paragraph, near it too on the Chico Rancho is the Joseph Hooker Oak, the largest live oak in the known world. Careful measurement and computation show that 7,000 persons could stand under its shadow when the sun rays were vertical. And these figures were verified by General William T. Sherman when he and President and Mr. Hayes visited it. And then he goes on to list its vital statistics, its size, and so forth. Uh, part of what I've been doing for this element has been uh, gathering as many historic images of the Hooker Oak as I could possibly find. Um, and I'll mention one here in just a moment. It, I, it's hard to date many of these. I don't know when this was made, but it was certainly right around the turn of the century, in the 1900s. Um, it's this, this massive, beautiful, elegant tree that's a lot like the Grand Canyon. It's very difficult to photograph in a way that communicates its scale and grandeur. And you see many people try. The tree itself is a valley oak, or Quercus lobata. Um, it comes from the Celtic quer, which means fine, 
and quiz, which means tree. I love that. Fine tree. And lobata, <coughs> as in lobes, or to lob a ball, which is to describe the shape of the leaves. And every time I think of Quercus lobata now, I think about lobbing a baseball and the shape of the leaves. Here are a few, few of the earliest pictures that I have uh, been able to identify of a group. The best, one in turn, best ones turn out to be in the winter so that you can see its shape and scale. You get a sense of the scale right here with uh, a horse and a carriage. It was a truly spectacular tree and enormous. Uh, it appears in photographs, in postcards. Uh, I like this one because of the Army and Navy stamp. This is in the 30s, after which they built a large concrete ring around it to protect it. People were driving up to the base of it, and uh, it, was, it was causing harm. They also built these enormous concrete pillars, and they had these platforms to support branches uh, because they would collapse under their own weight. A portion of the tree collapsed in 1964, and uh, people's you know, realized at the time that the tree wasn't going to last forever. Did I mention that they thought that this tree was over a thousand years old? Okay, they thought this tree was over a thousand years old. These are some pictures from uh, Dave Noble's dad, John Noble. Um, photographs of the tree on May 2nd, the day after it fell, 1977. This is the day it fell, May 1st. This was the plaque on that uh, concrete column, which was painted green. I had never seen it painted green until I saw Dave's slides. I had no idea. I had never seen this tree. Uh, I had never experienced it, but I had seen photographs of it, and it was just remarkable to me, even in the pictures, and so I was curious about it. This is one of Dave's own, own photographs. It was, of course, headline news, and uh, the news made its way, really, uh, around the world. Um, but it was certainly big news here in Chico. Uh, this is a photograph of Dave's mom, Penny Noble, made by his dad, standing in front of the tree, which fell and laid on the ground for two years before it was ultimately decided what to do with it. Uh, I'm running long, so I can't recount all of the stories, but it was a big controversy <coughs> of what to do with the tree after it fell. It wasn't an obvious decision, it wasn't an obvious choice. There were people who wanted it to remain where it was and to disintegrate and to have new trees rise from it. But there were other people that wanted to turn it into uh, things that could be used for promotion of the city and keepsakes and remembrances, remembrances of the tree. And there was the complicating factor of people going out there and snapping off parts for souvenirs and loading up the back of their pickups for firewood for the winter. So uh, it was a very complicated story. For two years it lay on the ground. So this is uh, Dave Noble in front of the grove. I thought these two uh, images together were remarkably poignant. And Dave no uh, John Noble went out regularly to photograph the tree throughout its life. And the title that I used for these two images is Penny and John Noble. 924 days after their loss. <coughs> Dave, I was going to read your letter, but I'm going to spare you. Letter to the editor. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, I knew the tree was gone, and uh, uh, Oliver Hutton has been a big, uh, has played a big role in this, and we really thought about trying to collect as many references and keepsakes about the Hooker Oak as possible. Turns out this is Oliver's high school diploma <laughs> that has the Hooker Oak on it. This is uh, the Caduceus, the yearbook for Chico High from 1923, which has the Hooker Oak as an opening page. I was driving along traffic this winter and pulled up behind the Hooker Oak plumbing service. Uh, uh, Tyler Ash, a former student of mine, collects photographs and paraphernalia, and this is a bottle from the Chico Soda Works with uh, an icon of the tree on it. This, I had never seen this before. This is absolutely beautiful. Um, it's it's a, a print that was made for a drug company here in Chico, or a drugstore here in town, and they, they used uh, John Bidwell's 
likeness on it. It was to commemorate the anniversary of the city of Chico. Well, this is where I start uh, becoming playful. Um, I have all these photographs of people in and among and around the tree, and so uh, I started embedding them in the photograph. And these are figures used to, to tell a story. Here's another one. It's a sequence of images of all these people around the base of the tree. Now, I first became interested in the tree because I wanted to collect postcards of Chico, and I saw this postcard on eBay. This was about 2000, the year 2000. And I didn't have much experience on eBay, and I started bidding on this, and it was a dollar, dollar fifty, somebody else was bidding. To 253. We got up to $35 <laughs> for a postcard of a tree that I thought, who cares about this tree? And I thought, I can't afford to collect postcards, I guess. We're not supposed to do this. But we, I got in contact with the person who was bidding on it and I asked her what, she, what they wanted it for. And it turns out that the person bidding on it was this girl, this older woman. She said, that's me in the picture and I want it. <laughs> I, I was like, well, you know, I wanted to, I, I'm, I just wanted to do something with it someday. So anyway, um, so uh, these of course don't really connect, but I was trying to connect them through space and through time, and to show all these different figures. There's really that's really the only way to get a sense of the scale. I absolutely love this one. I don't know if you can see it from where you are, but this guy's got a grin. And that guy's got a twinkle in his eye, and they must have had a great time at the base of that tree. <laughs> this is part of a stereoscopic <coughs> that I've never seen published. And you look at it through a stereoscopic viewer, and it, it just absolutely comes to life. So if we ever have an exhibition, uh, this will be on exhibition with this large uh, geologist viewer that I have. I didn't point it out, but this little girl appears in the very first uh, image in the sequence. Uh, and so uh, it's all from a single day. That's the same little girl hiding back there. I love that one. So this is the whole piece, and it's called Taking Measure and Finding Shade Beneath the Hooker Oak. Here's another postcard. I've loved it ever since I've seen it. Uh, inscribed on the bottom in somebody's handwritten handwriting is, in 1895, mother was under this tree. <laughs> and I, you know that's probably not mother, but that's somebody in a carriage and a horse. And so I took as many photographs as I could find with people underneath the tree and uh, tried to populate them. Um, to the best of my ability, about where they would have been or in the right scale. I love this 1970s postcard of this woman on the on a concrete pillar. It looks like a Maxfield Parrish figure. This is one of the classic images of the tree, where you see the front half of a horse and just the back wheels of the carriage right there. Um, if anything's iconic, that, that is. But of course, you have the guy hanging out up there in the tree. <clears throat> uh, I don't know who's who, but this is Dave Noble again and his brother and his sister, Bob and Janet. This guy in a uh, stovepipe hat. When were those popular? <laughs> when Lincoln was president. I don't know if this picture was from the 60s, but uh, it's conceivable. Gardens there. 
And so there was a connection there. So acorns were sent over. Uh, it's a long story. Some were not viable, so uh, some were sent over again later. Um, but I had an occasion to go to Europe, and so I routed through London right when I was learning all of this sort of stuff. And I visited a few uh, gardens uh, and made this image. Uh, the title is 5,231 Miles from Home and Across the Pond, Taking Measure of an Offspring of the Hooker Oak, 48 Years Old and Scrawny. <laughs> Uh, turns out the Valley Oaks don't do very well in London. <laughs> the climate's a little different there. A few more pictures. Uh, this pair is called Proof of Existence. Details from my visit with a descendant of the Hooker Oak at the Royal Botanical Bar Gardens in London. I have to say I was thrilled to find out that, uh, that there was a direct descendant of the Hooker Oak and it seemed like the legacy was continuing. Uh, at some point, though, the story got out that I was investigating the Hooker Oak, and, uh, and I was also using Wes Dempsey's files, who was a great file keeper, and I was reading articles, and, and I was reading references to people who had planted acorns, and so I started trying to track down people in, in these various articles throughout the years. And then the newspaper subsequently published an article about what I was doing, and so I got people calling me, and maybe some of you are here tonight, I haven't seen anybody, but people calling me saying, we planted an offspring of the Hooker Oak in 1965, 1955, 1977. So I have a sequence of about 12 known descendants, known in that their stories check out, they're plausible, they're verifiable. Um, this is sprouted from the Hooker Oak's final acorn crop, 1977. Uh, I, I, I gave the names to these trees based on the people that planted them or who continued to care for them. So this is the Eyeball Brown Oak one mile away from its parents. This is the Marlin Oak, planted in uh, 1952, circa 1952, 25 miles from the source. This is in Willows. It is, as far as I know, the largest uh, offspring of the Hooker Oak, and it's a beautiful tree. It's really great and starting to take on the shape of the original parent tree. This is a, this is a pair, the Copeland Oaks, here in Chico, circa 1977. This is the Cummins McGrath Oak, sprouted in 1977 here in Chico. All of these are intended to be large prints if we ever exhibit them that way, so you can see all the detail of the branches and leaves and so forth. This is the Guyard uh, Dutro Oak, circa 1976 in Paradise. This is also in Paradise. It's the Menden Oak at Menden's Nursery. Age is unknown, but I guess in, in 676-77. Uh, this is the Henry, Allen, Henry Rollins Oak in uh, Willows. It's another big one. When I visited, visited this tree to make a photograph, the renter of the home there had the tree strapped up with those big yellow nylon straps and, and uh, whatever, winches of and so forth, and he had his truck parked right here, and he, he sold tools. And I loved the whole thing, and he didn't want me to photograph the straps and the truck and all that sort of stuff. He, he wanted to clean it up and make it presentable, which I let him do, but I had to get the edge of the truck in. But I just, I just sort of loved how the, uh, it demonstrated you know, the relationship and care for something. And most of these are found in people's yards. You know, and they like reflecting on them and living with them. This is a tree that I'll bet most of you have walked past many, many times. This is the uh, Green Ringle Oak. Uh, I don't know how old it is, but it's in Ringle Park. You see uh, Bidwell Prez right there. Um, there's a story behind every one of these trees, and there are a few principal people involved with spreading the acorns, or sprouting them and spreading the, the buckets. Um, so, um, Here's another one. There, there are more than I'm even going to show you here, but this is the uh, fir oak, circa 1976. This is here in Chico. And I love this one. With the, it's just in the garden, and it's in terrific shape. Um, and you know, I have no doubt that there are dozens, perhaps hundreds more offspring of the hooker oak. And I know of, I've had reports of others elsewhere in the state that I have yet to visit. Um, and I have to say, the Ishii pictures taught me that history is measured in generations. 
Something that Hooker always taught me is that much of history dies with the participants. Because I've been trying to track down these descendants. Most of the people who were the caretakers of these trees, who planted them originally, have died in the last 10 years. And it really pointed out to me how sort of fragile the stories of these things that we care about are, and how we often don't record them in any sort of significant way. Um, and that, that, that just struck me about this. This particular tree, the, uh, uh, apparently the story goes, the husband collects acorns and he throws them over their fence row. And so this entire line of trees are grandchildren of the hooker oak. They're fairly large, and in fact, uh, a little detail, that's a scrub jay with an acorn in its beak. <laughs> Acorn, uh, scrub jays apparently can plant over a thousand acorns a year. They're very prolific. Plant, I say plant, very, I should say. Anyway, um, there are other remnants of the tree. This is uh, what remains of the tree in this municipal uh, lot. When the tree fell, a contractor came and uh, ultimately took part of the tree in payment for uh, harvesting the tree, and then the city got large portions of it. And the city has been using it for a variety of things over the years. Furniture has built, been built, podiums built, a number of different things, all of which I intend to photograph at some point. This is in the municipal lot making a picture. Oliver made a photograph of me while I was working. And that's, that's the last remaining lumber of the Hook Road that the city owns. We had to help haul that in back and forth. And I consequently got five big splinters in my hand, which I had to scan. So those are splinters in my palm from handling the remnants of the book. Uh, this is a bronze acorn from 1950. Um, it was used for some sort of commemorative piece. I don't know exactly what. Uh, and it's etched in bronze. This is one of the very first things that I did about two years ago, I guess. I found this photograph down in an archive in Riverside of this little girl stretched out in front of the tree. And the herbarium here on campus has one cutting from the original Hooker Oak. So that's from the tree. And uh, this is intended, it's intended, it will never be this way, but it's intended to be reproduced so that the size of that photograph is actual size, <laughs> making the entire piece be 30 feet by 40 feet, which would be fun, but I'm not holding my breath right now. <laughs> Just a few weeks ago, the uh, stump, the remaining stump at the site of the Hooker Oak was burned by vandals. Uh, yeah, if you didn't read in the paper, well, it happened. And uh, interestingly, I was completely ignoring the stump. I thought it was this weird, ugly thing, and I just, like, I was looking at other stuff and paying attention to other things, but it burned, and so I realized that this was my last chance to try to deal with a true remnant of the Hooker Oak. So, uh, so the picture that was used to promote this talk is a, a blended re-photograph, and the title of this is, At the Scene of the Crime, The Repositioned Remains of the Hooker Oak burned by vandals. That's a picture Sherry made of me while I was investigating what was inside the stump. And what was inside the stump were two small acorns that had sprouted. There was another tree, not a valley oak, but another tree uh, growing over it that had dropped its acorns and those had sprouted. Here's just another variation that I was trying. These are only a few weeks old, so I, you know, it's hard for me to tell what's worth keeping and what's not worth keeping, but that's the little girl and the little uh, boy that were at the site. This is uh, a scan of a big chunk of charcoal, which I had permission to take from the site and uh, scanned. And uh, so this is waterlogged and charred, a vandalized remnant from the stump of the road. It looks a little bit like a Colombian man with some mold. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the things I've been doing with Oliver is we've been uh, thinking about different ways of visualizing the tree. You know, we have pictures of it, we have pictures of people in relation to it, and we have its story, which is fascinating, and I haven't even gotten into it yet. Um, but we're also inter interested in uh, visualizing the life of the tree, visualizing what the tree saw, 
um, and it, it's, it's life. Uh, this is a timeline that shows some main events, uh, including when the tree fell, when a large portion fell, when it was named, and how it was verified. It was, of course, believed to be over a thousand years old, but after it fell, the, the rings on the tree were counted, and it was presumed, well, the, the, uh, Dr. King sent the acorns to London, uh, indicated that it was possibly two different trees that had grown together. Instead of being a thousand years old, the, the two sections that he counted rings on were 220. Help me out, Oliver. 226 yeah. and 222 22. Two years old. Now, um, Dr. Kingsley Stern's daughter lives here in town, and we have been in communication, and she's trying to find his notes so that we can look at those notes to find out for a fact whether or not that was the case. <coughs> One of the more interesting things I learned from her was that when the information came out that it was two trees, not one, or maybe it's one tree, who knows, but it was 220-something years old instead of 1,000, her dad received death threats. <laughs> <laughs> Which indicates to you how important the tree was as a symbol and how much people invested their identity into this magnificent thing. Okay, so uh, the estimation that the tree was a thousand years old was off by um, several hundred, eight hundred plus years. Here are some uh, specifications for the tree. There were at least three different signs that have appeared in the tree over the years that, is, that I've been able to figure out from looking at the pictures. This describes its height and its size and they, you know, these folks tried to uh, give us a sense of how big the tree was by saying nearly 8,000 people could stand underneath it. This is the same sign a few years later, I don't know how many years later, but uh, it was clearly vandalized. One of the earlier signs hung in the tree. This is a picture made for the 125th anniversary of the university. This fall? When was that? August. August. Okay. This shows almost 1,800 people. Now, I have not done the math to verify whether or not William Tecumseh Sherman, who verified 7,885 people could stand underneath this tree. I'm going to, I just haven't been. But if we took that picture and made it into about 8,000 people, that's how many it would be. I have to say I'm skeptical. <laughs> just again, I'm gonna crunch the numbers. But based on the measurements on the sign, Oliver and I started doing some work, and we found some measurements starting back in about 1850, uh, moving forwards all the way to 1977 when the tree fell, that sort of estimate its uh, growth and size over those time periods. We worked with somebody who'd done some, uh, some acorn counts of, uh, of, an ac of a tree, of an old tree, and so we decided to estimate the approximate number of acorns the tree would have produced during its mature life. So starting when the tree was roughly 50 years old, we did some calculations. I won't bore you with the details, but these are some numbers you need to commit to memory. Um, average annual acorn crop was about 273,000 uh, for a lifetime production of about 48 million acorns. An average acorn, weighs roughly five grams, or at least the one that I weigh, that's this one, and that's from one of the trees up in paradise. To help try to visualize that, if you went from Lassen Peak to uh, Mount St. Helens with acorns stacked in the end, it would take 2.8 times. So you could go there and back and almost back again. Yeah. If you were to try to think about it in terms of Colombian mammoths, <laughs> The dry weight of acorn production was about 240 metric tons, or about 30 Colombian mammoths. Now I know that most of you all don't have direct experience with the size and scale of Colombian mammoths, so uh, we <laughs> just as point reference. Now, don't get too excited. Mammoths and the tree were never together. That was really just for a joke. <laughs> But there are other things, like what did the tree see? Well, it saw approximately 82,490 uh, uh, sunrises and 82,489 sunsets. It fell about 5 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, it had almost a million hours of sunlight exposure. 
Um, and it turns out it had about 26 hours less of darkness. You think, how could that possibly be? Well, Oliver and I started investigating, and it turns out, well, you get a little bit more light in the morning and a little bit light in the afternoon, and over a period of 226 years, that adds up to be about 26 days. Um, the highest recorded temperature that the tree saw was 117 degrees, and the coldest was 11 degrees. Um, we're contemplating trying to figure out and, and estimate and sort of visualize the wide range of species that would have lived in and around the tree. The dozens of birds and squirrels and bears and, of course, Native Americans. And one of the most surprising discoveries to me recently has been that Thule elk used to roam this valley in large herds, and they would have been a major consumer of acorns until they were uh, hunted, not to extinction, but certainly hunted to small numbers during the gold rush. They would have been some of the primary consumers of the tree. So that prompted me to go out and to try to make a photograph of uh, what the tree would see if it were there today. And so this is um, a sequence of pictures made from the tree's point of view. And that's what it would see today. There are two, uh, two trees on site there that are believed to be offspring of the hooker oak. Um, it's too difficult to show you which ones they are there. But, um, <coughs> We're going to make a field trip as uh, a group and go out there and try to make photographs at night to get the night bird. <laughs> so um, here's the last piece, and, and I'll wrap everything up. Uh, I made this about a week ago. And uh, like many of the things I've done, I did it on a scanner. These are pollen clouds and leaves within the Quercus Lovata cluster. Yeah. It's not to scale. This is April 7th, 2013. I just put leaves on my scanner, and my, my youngest son, Ben, and I went out and collected pollen and, and had to do some tests to figure out how do you coax pollen out of pollen pods. It turns out the secret is you wait overnight, and then it just lets go of everything. Um, and so we sprinkle these on the scanner. And I'm going to end with this quote and some, uh, some thoughts uh, about this project uh, in its entirety, and some things that I've learned in the time that we have all been working together. Um, there's a quote from John Muir there. Uh, some of the things I've learned are that uh, every place has important stories if we choose to see them. I think about the day and a place that sort of seemed to be storyless, but, um, or the Hooker Oak, which has so many layers in, uh, of stories that uh, are only there if we look for them, uh, and, and we investigate and then we tell them. I've learned that stories need stewards. And I think for me personally, one of the things I've learned is that one of my roles as an artist is to be a steward of these stories that I uncover. I love doing the work. It's just, I, I love getting up in the morning and doing this sort of thing. But many of these discoveries need stories and they need people to tell, uh, to tell the stories. In thinking about loss, which was sort of the overarching theme of this project, and still is, I heard a photographer on campus a few weeks ago who was doing some work that was very, uh, very difficult and challenging on an emotional level because it dealt with uh, consumption and, and some of the, not some, but uh, some very serious issues uh, that we face as, as a group, as, as people. Um, and he had this quote that I really liked, and it was uh, that grief is a form of love. And so thinking back to that quote of all the new thinking is about loss and this it resembles all the old thinking. You know, I think just the, the form of loss, the feeling of having lost something is a, is a form of, of reverence and honor and love. And um, I think it's started to explain to me why I'm interested in these kinds of things. I've also learned that in thinking about discovery, I just feel better about myself after experiencing scales of time and space that are unlike my own, that are bigger or smaller and more vast. I can't explain why, but I suppose that it's as simple as thinking about, I, that thinking about big, big things is, is a form of reverence. And reverence and awe and curiosity are central to a question-driven life. And I think most of us in here are educators, and reverence and awe and curiosity are central to an education. And uh, it's really pointed out to me that uh, as, a, as someone who teaches, who works with people, that perhaps one of the most important things that I can do is communicate this sort of growing sense of awe and reverence 
for a world that's incredibly complicated and contradictory in many ways. Um, but I, I have to say, in thinking about these things, uh, it's been some of the most rewarding few years of my life, and it's been working with collaborators, but also contemplating these ideas that are, that are bigger than me. So I've gone longer than I wanted, but um, tough luck. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 